I want to build a little bit on top of what we did in the previous video and try to create a complete standalone plugin from our segmented plane implementation as opposed to having just an instance inside the scene. So to begin, I want to just open my plane with the segments which we have saved out in the previous video before. And I'm just going to go and open the plugin again. And I, I can see that in the previous video, I forgot about these isolated nodes here, which were left over from the very first video. So I'm just going to select them and I'm going to delete them. Uh, and we're left with just the nodes that we need and the nodes that actually do stuff. So first thing I want to do is clean things up a little bit and prevent user from doing anything really too radical. If you think about it, we're, there is never going to be a scenario where we are going to go and need less than two columns. But right now I'm actually able to set negative values and I'm able to set zero and one and so on. This is not very good for the algorithm because it will create errors within the graph. It will not cause anything, any problems inside the viewport, but because there are errors inside the graph, the user might not know what is going on if the graph is closed. So what we want to do is we want to limit both columns and rows to have at least value of two specified at any given point. And we probably don't really want them to have anything too ridiculously high. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into our editor and I'm going to right click on columns. And we have a little menu, which is a menu given for every single input. And it allows you to specify extra information about each input. So the very first field, as you can see, is the type of the sport. Currently, it's system.in32, which means it's a 32-bit integer. And I can change this type to anything we want. Next goes the default value. So what is going to be assigned to this value when the user creates this plugin? And the value we want to enter here will probably something above the minimum value, but still reasonable enough so that it is very simple in the viewport. So let's set this to five. Next, we have our, our minimum value, and this is the value we discussed before, which is two. We don't really want user having less than two columns at any given point. And next value is going to be our maximum value. And I'm just going to put a bunch of nines here so that users, user doesn't go above this. But for the sake of the story, let's, let's add, the, uh, let's put 99 here. So this updates our columns automatically. And if I go and try to change it now, you can see that I cannot go below two. And if I keep scaling this up, I will not be able to go above 99. So this is 99 is the maximum amount of segments that we can have. The default value will be five, but the reason it's not five right now is because we have already preset a value of two before. So I'm just going to go back and change it to five just for the sake of it. So we, we're just going to do the same thing with the rows. And uh, it is this, exactly the same type of field as columns, except that it, that it defines the rows, the vertical segments, as opposed to horizontal ones. I'm going to set the default value to five. Then I'm going to set the minimum value to two. And the maximum value is going to be also 99. Next, we have our width and our height. And while it is probably OK to have negative width, we might want to restrict the user from having to just have a positive width for the sake of this tutorial. So let's right click on width. It is a system single, which means it's a floating point value, single precision floating point value. And the default value, let's call it 30. And minimum value, let's set it to 0 0.001. And maximum value, let's set it to something big so that we're not really constraining the user too much in what they can do. So. 99,999 sounds like an okay value to me. Now, if we go to our width and try to scale it down, 0 0.001 is the smallest value that we can set and the maximum will be our value. And I really probably sh won't be able to scale it up all this way with a spinner, but it is there, the limit is there. So we'll do the same thing with the height. We set the minimum to 0 0.001. Uh, well, uh, sorry, this is a default. So we set the default to I think it was 30 here. Yeah. So let's set the default to 30. Our minimum is going to be this and our maximum is going to be just a large value, which we just want to have there to prevent any oddities from happening when the user plays around with these values. Um, so that's it. We have now defined our values and the next thing to do will be to actually have this as a separate plugin. As you can see right now, I just have a mesh in my viewport that is an instance 
object. So this means that I can, if I delete this object altogether from the scene, it's going to be gone along with all the work that we did. And what we want to do now is to create a reusable plugin, which a user can then go and create from a create panel, just like we did with the fear lab templates. To do this, we need to go back to the editor. And this is a good time to introduce these two entry boxes at the top here. The very first entry box is the one we're interested in. The second one, as I described in the, in the other video, allows you to specify which uh, node or sub node you're currently editing. In this case, we have all the nodes visible in our graph. This is why it has this, this wildcard star here. And if I click, for example, on my vertex generator, it's going to jump into the vertex generator by specifying its, its X path. This is called X path. Uh, this whole definition here. And if I go back, it goes back to being this. So what we're interested in doing right now is setting the meta X path, which means that this is an X path for the object type as opposed to the object instance. And the left field over here allows us to specify the meta X path. As you can see, this field is empty right now, which means that this object is actually an instance within the, th within the scene. But if I start typing something, so I always have to start with a forward slash, and then I'm, I will type something like uh, my plugins. So this is going to be the category for my plugins. And then I type another slash. And now it's it's turning red to notify me that this is not a legal XPath syntax because I actually need to specify a name at the end. And then I'm gonna call my my plugin uh, plain with segments. Let's give it this name with segments. As we type this, we can see that now it presents us with an option to save this this plugin. And if I press it, it actually saves the plugin to the disk. And in one of the future tutorials, I will explain exactly where it's saving the plugin and what the implications of that are. But for now, we are okay just knowing that it saved it somewhere. And just to explain in a little bit more detail, you can keep adding forward slashes and the very last name that you enter is going to be the actual name of your plugin. All the slashes before, all the components that you had before, like my plugins, are basically just a way of categorizing your creations into categories and subcategories and so on. So think of this as, as a URL inside a web browser where you can type a website name and then you can type a bunch of a bunch of subdirectories on that website. This is a very similar deal. So now that we have saved this plugin, we actually need to restart 3ds Max. And when we do, I'm going to go back to our creation panel over here. And if I click it down, we can now see this My Plugins category, which I have just saved my plugin as. If I click here, we have the Plain with Segments plugin. The text doesn't really fit in here. It's probably a good idea to name your plugins something shorter, maybe just Plain would do, but in this case, it doesn't fit, it doesn't really matter. If I click on it, I can now see that my default values are assigned. We have 30, 30, 5, 5, which were all default values. And I can click, in, click inside the viewport to create my plane object. So this plane object is actually now a plugin. And if I go, I can change the parameters just like I did before. I can change the counts and do other kinds of manipulations with it. So now having this plane here, I can simply go back to my initial creation panel and I can create another plane and I can move this one out of the way and I can create another one and so on. So this just demonstrates that the plane is actually a plugin now and not an instance within the Maxin. And it is a reusable plugin. In the future, we will discover how we can sort of take this plugin and give it to a friend and let them use it as well. But for now, this is it.